I call to order the Rosemont Planning Commission meeting for Tuesday, October 25th. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any additions to tonight's agenda? Madam Chair, there are not. Thank you. Is there any input from the audience on items that are not on tonight's agenda? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move forward to the consent agenda. The consent agenda this evening includes the approval of the September 27th, 2022 regular meeting minutes. Are there any comments or questions on the consent agenda? I'd make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner Kenniger and seconded by Commissioner Powell. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> motion carries. The next section on our agenda this evening is old business. And we've got a request by Schaefer Richardson for approval of a planned unit development, final site and building plan, and preliminary plat to construct two multifamily buildings containing 336 dwellings. And I will turn this over to Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so just a summary of the request, as you said, there's a request for a final site and building plan as part of the Presswick Place planned unit development. Uh, since the uh, 20, September 27th meeting, uh, the applicant has updated their site plan. Uh, they are no longer requesting deviations from the zoning ordinance uh, related to height or parking. The eastern building was reduced in height by one story uh, and from 55 and a half feet to 43 feet. And then uh, the reduction in the number of units from 336 to 305 reduced their parking requirement. Uh, there were uh, five stalls added to allow the site plan to meet the zoning ordinance standard for two stalls per unit. So then in addition to the final site and building plan, the applicant is requesting approval of the preliminary plat that would split the parcel into two lots, uh, each containing one of the buildings. Just a little background, you can see the site here is located in the northeast quadrant of Akron Avenue and Connemara Trail. Uh, 42 is uh, kind of along the south side here with Akron running north and south. The land use designation for the site within the city's comprehensive plan is uh, high density residential. It was guided that in 2007 uh, with the Presswick Place planned unit development. Additionally, the site zoning is currently uh, R4 high density residential. So at the September 27th meeting, the commission voted to continue the meeting to allow staff to provide a review of the traffic analysis and to allow the applicant uh, time to update the landscape plan and submit the photometric plan. The commission may recall the landscape plan was short one tree uh, because the landscape requirement is based on the number of units. Uh, the reduction in those units um, allowed the landscape plan as a submitted uh, to meet the zoning ordinance requirements. Additionally, the applicant did provide us a photometric plan, uh, which I will review uh, coming up here. Uh, at that meeting, the commission received comments related to the following issues. Uh, there was some oppo opposition to the requested deviations for building height and parking. Uh, there was concerns about traffic, site lighting, impacts on schools and parks, the ability of police and fire to adequate the city's need, adequately meet the city's needs, as well as others that were highlighted in the meeting minutes. Uh, just a reminder, the Planning Commission's authority uh, for this request, site plan reviews and plats are quasi-judicial in nature. Uh, therefore, the Commission is being asked to consider if the request is consistent with the land use designation and conforms to the standards of the zoning ordinance. And if yes, the, the Commission should recommend approval. Uh, if a recommendation for denial uh, is made, it must be made based on evidence that the project does not meet those requirements and that the findings uh, to that effect must be made by the Commission. Uh, the updated site plan, the building footprint did not change with the reduction of the eastern building. To provide a little uh, orientation, the left side here would be Connemara Trail. Uh, the bottom of the site plan is Adeline Avenue. Uh, and then the, the right side is to the north. Uh, the applicant did provide five additional stalls, three of which are shown in proof of parking highlighted in the northwest corner here, as well as two surface stalls that will be constructed with the project. Uh, the, the two stalls per unit, including the proof of parking, meets the zoning ordinance requirements. Uh, to be built with the project, uh, the ratio is 1.7 stalls per unit, unless needed uh, as determined by the city. 
As I said, the landscape plan uh, was to be updated to provide an additional tree because there is a reduction of the number of units by 31. Uh, only a total of 161 trees are required. Uh, the landscape plan as submitted includes 175 trees. Based on the building perimeter, which did not change, a uh, total of 2,373 plants well exceeds the 293 foundation plantings required by the city code. Uh, the photometric plan uh, provided by the applicant, it's hard to see here. Um, it is able to be zoomed in, in in the Planning Commission's packet, shows that the maximum illumination at the property lines is 0.1 lumens. Um, there isn't a specific standard for the R4 zoning district uh, as it is a residential use, uh, but there are standards for commercial districts and industrial districts that have a limit of 0.5 lumens at adjacent residential property lines which are measured across the street uh, from the building. Uh, in that case, there's a zero lumens shown on the photometric study. All pole mounted lights are 20 feet in the parking lot areas, 15 feet in the drive aisles, which is also within the zoning ordinance standards. The applicant did provide a couple cross sections showing uh, the building in comparison to the two streets, uh, the two adjacent streets in the left side of the screen, you'll see Akron Avenue uh, on the bottom half, kind of showing the site plan with a section to the top. And then on the right hand side is Adeline Avenue, uh, the bottom half showing the site plan with a section on the top. Uh, the Planning Commission did express and receive comments related to the parks. The Parks and Recreation staff and Commission did review the proposed development and concluded that the park system uh, would not be overburdened and continues to recommend fee in lieu of parkland dedication. There's a neighborhood park to the east of the development area that's planned as part of the Talamore project, as well as a new school at Akron Avenue and Bon Air Path. Additionally, there's a planned underpass under County Road 42 being planned by the county that would head to the south where a future school is anticipated, south of the uh, uh, Dakota County fields, as well as the larger park system within Amber Fields. There was a traffic analysis. The city's engineering consultant uh, did review the analysis. The a revised study was submitted for review um, and is currently being, un being reviewed by the, the consultant. Um, an additional analysis was conducted by the city's engineering staff and county traffic engineers uh, with the following con uh, comments provided, which are listed before you. Uh, important to note that the collector streets typically have an average daily traffic capacity of uh, 3,000 to 15,000. So from a functional classification perspective, this level of traffic is expected for the road system uh, and was anticipa anticipated by the city's 2040 comprehensive transportation plan. Uh, also note the site has been guided and zoned for such a use since 2007 and the, the street system was designed with this project in mind. Uh, there were some comments about traffic on Adolin Avenue. Um, it is a local street. Uh, it differs significantly due to the fact that there are no private driveways directly accessing the street. Um, the apartments have always been anticipated and that's why the limited uh, number of accesses onto the street were designed that way. Uh, the city will continue working with the county in coordination of an overall comprehensive traffic study just to anticipate the impacts of the overall development site uh, in the area and uh, identify any necessary improvements to intersections such as Connemara and Akron. Uh, also note that neither the city's consultant or the county's engineering staff disputed the findings that the roadway system was sufficient, had sufficient reserve capacity. Uh, with that, I can take any questions. I know we have a, quite a few people here that can uh, speak to some of the questions that this commission may have that I'm not able to answer. Specifically, we have our Parks and Recreation Director, uh, Dan Schultz. We have a representative from the Dakota County Transportation Department, as well as uh, the City Administrator and Public Works Director. Thank you, Anthony. Are there any comments or questions from the commission at this time? Um, I, I have one, yeah. Yep, so, go ahead, Commissioner Reed. Um, regarding the parks, you know, I, um, we've seen um, uh, diagrams that show the number of parks in the area, but I think one of the questions that's come up, uh, and it'll come up again, I think, in a later um, motion, is on the actual metrics. So um, our parks are based, I'm sure, on some kind of per capita. Mm -hmm. So with the per capita increase in these apartment buildings, 
how are we calculating and factoring that into the number of parks we have now and are planned? Is there a relationship to current per capita and what the expected growth is? Okay. And I would defer to Dan Schultz on that one. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commission members. Uh, to answer the question about per capita, with a neighborhood park, we look to try and have a guideline set for about 2,000 residents that would be serviced by a neighborhood park. Um, in this area, there are several recreational amenities that are available to the public. There is Greystone Park, which is, I think I have it, I think there's a memo in your packet. Uh, Greystone Park is 0.45 miles. Uh, away from the edge of the, or from the center of this development, the future school is 0.63 miles away, and the future Talamore is 0.72 uh, miles away, and Aylesbury is 0.32 miles away. So there are several areas that that are available for recreation. Um, one of the things that I would say is that another guideline that, that we follow along with a lot of other cities in, in the metro area throughout the state of Minnesota is we try to identify having a, a park uh, within a half mile or three quarters of a mile, which is about an eight to 12, 15 minute walk. And we feel like that's a reasonable amount of space to go. Um, I think we've also talked before with uh, commission members about um, where we put our parks and that's done uh, based on types of development and also patterns of development we look at several different um, you know bits of information when we when we go ahead and put together uh, our, our parks master plan and we have a master plan in the comprehensive guide plan which is which is its own chapter and in that the system plan talks about growth and we plan for growth like this and we look at you know how the the land is zoned and how it might you know how it might develop uh, as part of the as part of the plan and so like i said we look at trying to target uh, a serve a population of a thousand to two thousand people or approximately 650 households um, i looked at the number of households that are in uh, the Greystone development, and it's about 200, I think it was 235, if I, if I, if I recall what I looked up. Um, and so if you add all of these households, you're still not over that threshold of either 2,000 people or 650 households. Um, I, I would tend to think that a lot of these people are going to look to go um, to the north a little bit and either use um, the, the meadow, or I'm sorry, not meadows, the um, Greystone Park, or maybe even a little bit further east to use Talamore, so they're not having to cross Akron Avenue. Um, but obviously, like all of you who have had kids in town, they want to go to certain parks. They want to go to the Zipline Park. My kids growing up wanted to go to the Fire Station Park over at Meadows next to the Fire Station. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of jumping around to parks, and so I think this area is going to have a lot of opportunities and so I don't think any one space is going to be overrun with use now with that being said um, you know some people might say well Aylesbury Park is used four nights a week the parking lots full well it's going to be full during baseball in-house baseball and in-house soccer and it was designed to be that way and that's the same with the rest of our parks that have parking lots and athletic fields they're designed to be used by the community for you know, intramural and, and in-house type sports. Um, but as far as um, you know, what, what uh, our senior planner Nemchek mentioned, um, there's a greenway trail that runs right down Connemara. There's gonna be an underpass under Highway 3, which is gonna get us over to the Ames Soccer Complex at DCTC. It's gonna get people down to the Umore ball fields. And then we are acquiring land from the Amber Fields development um, where we're going to be building a 15-acre dog park and 12 pickleball courts. And so that's all interconnected by trails, and it's all in a very walkable manner. So I, I think hopefully people will look at the big picture uh, for that east side and understand that it's not just, it's not always just, you know, the, the, the moving in or development of one little area. It's, you got to look at the, the bigger surrounding area. And we don't know yet what that school is going to look like. I'm sure that school that's gonna go in at the corner of Akron and uh, Bonaire 
is going to have some sort of amenities. Playground, um, and the playgrounds that the schools put in are usually twice the size of the city's playgrounds that we put in. Um, I don't know if, if you can pull up the, the dais here, uh, but that's one comment that uh, I know our city um, community development director had asked me about um, was just about capacity, and I can just tell you that, you know, for a park like uh, Aylesbury, um, if we can zoom in on that. One second, Dan. Yeah. So this is just kind of a comparison of playgrounds. Um, and when we looked at developing the park uh, for <clears throat> Aylesbury Park, uh, we knew that was going to be an active, busy area of Rosemount. I mean, we just knew that looking at the comp guide plan, talking to our planners, we knew that was going to be an area that would have a lot of, a lot of use. So if you look at the playground sizes here, Rosemont Elementary's playground is about 14,000 square feet, which is a large playground, and that's meant to house a lot of kids. That's meant to have recess and, and being swamped by kids. If you look at Shannon Park, that's about 10,850 uh, 10, square feet. Uh, and if you look at city parks um, near these development areas that we're talking about tonight, Aylesbury Park is 10,600 square feet and has some pretty robust amenities where you know, we have a, a climbing spider um, uh, triangle, like trapeze uh, piece of equipment where it holds a lot of kids. And we don't put that in most of our neighborhood parks. Um, Greystone Park is 6385 square feet. Bloomfield Park is 5600 square feet for their playground. Meadows Park is 54. Birch Park is 5200. And the Flint Hills Athletic Complex is 4600. So, uh, you know, we, we look at the patterns that we know are coming for development. We try to right size the parks by some of the anticipated growth that we're going to see in the kinds of, of families we're going to see, things like that. Um, so um, I'm not here to tell people that uh, their opinion is wrong when they think the park is, is busier than it should be. Um, we build parks to be used. Uh, we're thrilled when we hear that there's a lot of kids out in the parks. It's great to drive by on Connemara. I don't live far from that area, so I, I'm driving by Connemara all the time. I love seeing full court pickup basketball games going on. Um, we like seeing the zip line having three or four kids hanging on the seat, gliding along on the zip line. We think that's great. And so um, with that, hopefully that helps a little bit on the insight with the parks. Um, but, you know, I feel like from a standpoint of, of where we've placed our parks, we feel like we place them appropriately where people will have good access for recreation in more than just one opportunity. They'll have multiple opportunities for recreation. Thank you. Any other questions? Before Can I say a quick yes. question? This square footage you're showing, is it's just square footage of the playground? Just the play surface. Right, so it's, not so it's just the hard, hardwood, uh, mulched hardwood surface. It's just the playground. It doesn't have anything to do with ball fields or soccer fields or parking lots. It's just simply the play surface. And so that's how a lot of people like to equate, um, you know, how big that play surface is, is by square feet. So that's what we were just wanted to show tonight, that we did plan ahead make that one bigger than we usually do. Um, and, and I can tell you that some of the other ones we're looking at replacing uh, next spring, which would be Claret, which is behind Cub Foods. We're gonna replace Kidder, and we're gonna replace uh, Biscayne. Um, Kidder will probably be about 3,200 square feet. Um, Claret will probably be right around 4,800. And Biscayne will be around 5,000 square feet. So again, this is, this is set up to really hold a lot of activity at this park. And so hopefully it's, it's meeting those needs. Thank you. And Dan, this doesn't include the Amber Field. So yet to come is the Amber Field. Yeah, parks correct. That will be, there'll be an underpass from the, from north of 42 down there. Yeah, correct. As well. Uh, Madam Chair, there, there, there are four more parks that will be added not including the dog park and the pickleball area, there'll be four more parks as part of the Amber Fields development, which is on the southwest corner of uh, Akron and 42. Okay, thank you. Yep. Are there any other questions for 
Is there a timeline for some of the newer parks and the new school that's being proposed? Is it five years? Is it two years? I don't have a good timeline for the school. I'm looking at our city administrator to see if he might have communicated with the district more recently than I have, but I don't. Um, the, the Talamore Park, we're looking at probably late 23, uh, which is a little bit to the east of this. Greystone already exists. Um, the parks, uh, the, the dog park and the pickleball, uh, we had our kickoff meeting today. We're working with a, a consultant, uh, Bolton and Mank. Uh, they are gonna be designing that. The plan is to bid that out and try to build it this spring of 2023. Um, my understanding is the underpass uh, hopefully will get built next summer. So summer of 2023 under, under uh, 42. Country Road 42, thank you. Um, and so there's a lot happening right now, and I know that there will be a lot of opportunities for the, for the area in the future. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Are any other comments or questions from the commission on this item? <clears throat> I just had one comment. Um, my main concern last meeting was the fifth story on that second building, and that has been adjusted, so that is good to know. Um, the other question I just had for the traffic, I actually ventured down to this location a couple times now just to take a look at it. Um, is there a reason why, well, let me ask this. Is all of the traffic from both of the apartment complexes going to all collect out on Adolin? From both buildings? Yes. Yeah, the two ac there's two accesses on Adolin. Okay, so there'll actually be two driveways on Adolin for the two apartment rooms. Right, okay. correct. Um, and my only question was, is there any reason why they didn't consider having an access out of the area onto Connemara at the, because it's kind of not really busy right there right now. And sure. I was just concerned, or questioned why it wasn't considered. So um, without getting too much into um, Nick Egger, our Public Works Director's uh, space on that. Connemara being a collector street, the city does try to limit uh, accesses onto that street from public roadways. So having a private driveway onto Connemara is not ideal. I think maybe if you have anything to add to that. No, thanks, Anthony. That, that's a pretty accurate statement there. And I, the only thing that I'll add is that uh, part of the issue there that we run into with placing a private driveway or even a roadway in close proximity to another, uh, to an intersection such as the one by Akron, that can tend to cause uh, congestion access type issues when it's so close together. So that is why uh, the routing was laid out in that way to place it off of the local street directly adjacent on Adeline instead. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Are there any other questions for city staff at this time? Anthony, I believe the applicant is here this evening um, as well to speak about the changes, changes that they made to this building. Correct. I think if they would like to come forward, they, they're welcome to do so at this time. Good evening. Good evening, members of the commission. My name is Peter Orth. I am a development manager for Schaefer Richardson, and I will be the uh, project manager for, for this site. Um, we just want to thank you again for, for giving us the time to um, take a look at the site and consider some of the feedback from um, both the public as well as the commissioners. Um, the decision to reduce um, the height obviously was, um, don't want to say a no-brainer, but it made sense for the project. Um, and um, in doing so, we also provided some visuals that Anthony just showed to show um, the, a section view of, the, uh, of each building mm -hmm. kind of in reference to the streetscape and for neighboring structures across the street, um, both to the east and to the west, just to show um, what the visual impact would be for both sides. Um, if there's any comments on that, we can um, happy to answer any questions on the height uh, the reduction in height um, also resulted in a reduction in 10% uh, of the units um, for the whole project. 
and um, that also reduced the traffic impact in the uh, traffic analysis. I know that both of these were aspects that were very important for the commission to consider last time. Um, and our, our consultant did reissue a new um, version of that traffic analysis to include the reduction in units. Um, again, it was about a 10% reduction in trips. Um, the level of service for each of those intersections, uh, again, not to dive too far into the traffic analysis, I know we've talked about it previously and the engineers have looked at it, um, but it does reduce the total congestion for the, for the entire site. Um, so that's also a benefit for the project. And then uh, we were also asked to provide a photometric study, kind of showing some of the light distribution for the site. Um, again, kind of standard overhead uh, pole mounted fixtures, um, not exceeding 20 feet. Our buildings are gonna have some down lighting as well, um, but with the, the buffering for the trees that we have in the landscaping plan, that's gonna also offer um, a barrier between our project and, and the right of way. Um, so with, with all these changes, I think it's, it's um, a much more palatable project. Um, to, to staff's comment, we are um, compliant with zoning um, in all aspects, including the parking. Um, we do have 1.7 stalls that we are actually building for the for this, uh, project as opposed to 1.54. Uh, from the previous submittal. Um, we know that that's a comfortable amount of parking that we provided based on um, similar developments that we've done in the past, and I'm happy to provide examples. Um, but um, if there are any questions about the plans, any revisions that we've made, I'm happy to um, address those at this time. Thank you, Peter. I just have a couple questions just to confirm and clarify. The, with the reduction of the one story, the units did not change in building B, which is the, um, which, That's the building A is the market rate and building B would be the, um, not low income, but the affordable workforce housing. housing. Yeah. Thank you. That's correct. So, okay. And then the amenities in terms of the pool and all that, that is staying the same. It's staying the same. Correct. Okay. So no loss of amenities for the residents. Just a different, slightly different mix of units in building A and 30 less units. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions from commissioners? I don't have questions, but uh, comments. Um, thank you for the drawings, um, the section drawings that showed the scale of the building. Uh, but the housing across, it's good to know that it's not the stall imposing blocky building. Um, it was pretty obvious it was well represented. Um, also, like how the building is massed, broken up, and it's not the solid block sitting there, but we had <clears> the <throat> elements that were shown all through and planned out. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the commission? Yeah, just one, one more clarification, I guess. So the, the current plan is to go to 1.54, but can go up to 1.8? So uh, 1.7 okay. um, constructed with about 90 parking stalls offered as proof of parking in the um, southwest corner of, of the site. So if, if um, the city determines later on af after construction that there is a need for additional parking, that's what those are reserved for. Right now it's just flat. Um, you know, there might be a curb there, but that's what that's, what that's offered as proof of parking and if to hit the two stalls per unit. <clears throat> With the reserved, it would go up to two. Yes. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Thank you. Thank you. Anthony, do you have anything further on this before we proceed? Uh, no, Madam Chair, I do not. Okay. Um, so um, if other commissioners have comments or questions, um, we can hear those at this time. This was, this was a public hearing last time on September 27th, so it is not a public hearing this evening. Um, and we will, we've got two motions before us. Um, I will kind of echo Commissioner Tiergarden's comments and Commissioner Rivera's. I appreciate the applicant taking back the feedback and reducing the height um, and doing some of the extra, the photometric plan for us and 
reviewing the traffic um, and such and bringing it into conformance with, with the zoning ordinance for that area. Um, I do believe that the plan is now in conformance with the comp plan and zoning um, and this land use has been planned since 2007 for this area. So I, I appreciate them taking the time to, to review it and um, make those adjustments. I, I would echo the same things. I, I think you know my concerns uh, from the last meeting were really about the, about the building height and making a good transition to the residential areas there. That's been resolved. The parking, I think that's been resolved. Last meeting, we talked about security. I felt comfortable with, with the way they described security for the, the, the complex. So I, I'm, I'm in favor of approving this. Any other comments or questions from the commission? No, Madam Chair, with the changes made by the applicant and the additional information, all my concerns have been addressed. And I would put forth a motion to recommend City Council approve the preliminary plat for the subdivision of Outlaw A, Presswick Place, townhome, subject to the five conditions noted in the staff report. Second. It has been moved by Commissioner Powell and seconded by Commissioner Abair. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, I'll, I'll make a motion for the second motion. Recommend the City Council approve the plan unit development final site and building plan to construct two multifamily buildings in the northeast quadrant of Connemara Trail in Akron Avenue, subject to the following conditions, numbered one through six. Second. It has been moved by Commissioner Reed and seconded by Commissioner Powell. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. That concludes this item on the agenda this evening. This item will move forward to the City Council meeting on November, tentatively on November 15th. The next item on our agenda this evening, of the agenda which I've lost, um, is a public hearing request by Akron 42 LLC for approval of preliminary and final plats, site plan review, and rezoning of a portion of the site to develop a 225 unit multifamily community. And this, um, is a public hearing that is being reopened and continued from our September 27th meeting. And Anthony, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, staff is uh, requesting that the Planning Commission reopen the public hearing for this uh, following a review of the letters that went out for public hearing notices. Staff found a uh, shortfall in the total number of letters that should have been out. So in an effort to be transparent and allow anyone who uh, would like to provide comment that maybe did not receive notice, uh, staff is uh, requesting a reopening of the public hearing. Uh, as uh, just a uh, kind of background summary of this request, uh, the applicant is requesting uh, rezoning of the site from C4 PUD uh, general commercial to R4 high density uh, residential, as well as a um, site plan review uh, to construct an apartment building and a preliminary and final plats for the site. Uh, should note that the, the city council did uh, Reguide this, uh, approve a, an amendment to the city's comprehensive guide plan, uh, changing the land use of the site from uh, CC Community Commercial to our, or excuse me, HDR High Density Residential. Uh, so updates for the commission from that 20, September 27th meeting, uh, there was an up, updated site plan that reduces the height of the southern portion of the building to three stories, reducing the number of units by 13 to 212 units. Uh, the landscape plan has been updated to provide additional screening around the pool area. That was a comment received by the commission and additional uh, amenity of a pickleball court has been added to the site plan. Uh, the applicants also provided renderings depicting the proposed building as it appears from various view sheds and submitted a traffic analysis for review uh, for the traffic impacts on the surrounding roadways. The site location for the overall plat is uh, in the northwest quadrant of Akron Avenue and County Road 42, uh, south of Connemara Trail, highlighted here in yellow. The land use designation for the site is uh, high density residential shown in brown in the center of the, the image and the requested rezoning is from the uh, C4 general commercial to the uh, R4 high density residential which is consistent with the city's comprehensive land use plan for the site. The final plat being proposed by the applicant shows two buildable lots the first being on the northern portion of the site, which would be the location of the apartment building, as well as a buildable lot in the southeast corner of the site, which would remain zoned commercial for a future commercial development. 
Uh, additional land, shown as outlot A, remains available for commercial development. The city did complete a study or an exercise in 2021 to identify future development patterns. I think the commission is uh, aware of this from the last meeting. Just wanted to highlight that the proposed residential development uh, fits with that sort of vision for the area, uh, allowing addition or uh, con commercial development to continue to be possible along 42 and at the corner of Akron Avenue. Again, a rendering from the visioning showing in the, in the apartment area, high density residential, the um, through street is realigned a little bit, uh, but I just wanted to note that uh, because there was some confusion uh, last time, the actual proposed roadway does not align with Aylesbury. It actually uh, connects with Abbey Field a little to the north, and I show that uh, shortly. Uh, the site itself, again, is 7.97 acres with a density of 26.6 units per acre. Uh, when the city's comprehensive traffic plan or transportation plan is designed, it takes into account uh, maximum buildable area. Uh, the, the proposed rezoning from commercial to R4 high density is the similar intensity, and therefore um, the traffic uh, impacts on the streets are, are not as exaggerated as going from another use to R4. Again, the total number of units is 212, and that's a reduction of 13 from the previously proposed 225. Uh, here's the site plan review, or the site plan showing the actual alignment for the proposed street. Here, uh, the access points into the proposed apartment building are from this uh, street running from Abbey Field to Akron Avenue, uh, with the connection being made uh, northeast of the Aylesbury Avenue. Uh, intersection. As I said, the landscaping plan was updated. Additional trees were provided around the, the pool area, um, and the site uh, requires a total of 114 trees. 119 trees are provided in the, in the landscape plan. Uh, the city is not looking to acquire park land with this development, is re recommending cash in lieu. Here's one of the renderings provided by the applicant from the intersection of Aylesbury and Abbey Field of the uh, proposed apartment building, this being the three-story area, the, uh, to the further in the distance being four stories in height. Uh, on the right-hand side of the picture is the field as it appears today. As you can see, there's a wide pipeline easement running along Abbey Field Avenue, uh, creating additional buffer from those residences on that side of the street. Uh, a little closer in here from the actual intersection of the new east-west road connecting Abbey Field to Akron Avenue. You can see the um, reduced height, three-story building. And then here from uh, the backyard of one of the uh, uh, houses on uh, Aylesbury Court. And then finally from the north uh, at Abbey Field and Connemara Trail. Uh, in the foreground here would be the stormwater ponds that would be utilized for on-site uh, water management. Um, again, Parks and Rec Commission uh, reviewed the proposed development and continues to recommend fee in lieu of land dedication. Uh, the, there's the additional pickleball court uh, in addition to a dog park and the swimming pool as earlier mentioned. Uh, I don't want to go too far into it as Dan did a really good job uh, with the last item describing how the um, Parks and Recreation Commission uh, reviews proposed developments and uh, plans for parks in the future. Uh, the traffic analysis that was submitted by the applicant uh, is being reviewed by staff. It supports the assumptions made by the 2040 Comprehensive Plan regarding development in this part of the city. Uh, peak hours are anticipated to see 78 trips in the morning and 83 trips in the p.m. hours. And then 60% of those trips are anticipated to travel west on County Road 42 with 30 uh, traveling east. There's three actions being re recommended for this item. Uh, I would recommend ordering them as they are on the screen with the first being the rezoning motion uh, followed by the plat motion and then finished up with the site plan review. Uh, with that, I can take any questions. As I said, there are plenty of people here who can uh, help support any answers I'm not able to speak to. I know we have the applicant as well as the property owner who is selling the site to the applicant. Thank you, Anthony. Are there any questions from the commission on this item? I do have one. Yep, Commissioner Rivera. 
Um, I guess I'm not familiar with the term re-guided by the city council. Can you, can someone explain what that exactly means? So the city has a comprehensive land use plan and that's the overarching guide for development within the city. And then beneath that is the zoning ordinance and the zoning map. So when uh, land is re-guided, it changes the land use designation so that any future zoning must be consistent with that land use designation. Uh, it went before the Planning Commission in July and was approved by the Council in August. Does that answer your question? I just wanted to understand the process. Okay. Any other questions from the Commission? This time. Okay, thank you, Anthony. At this time, we will open up the public hearing for this item, and we will invite those that would like to come forward and speak to do so at this time, coming to the podium stating your name and address for the record, and we will start with inviting our applicant up and the landowner up to speak on this project at this time. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners, and thank you, Anthony, for the work um, and the presentation. Uh, the updates from last time, as Anthony covered, were the step down of the building. Can I get you to just state your name and address? Oh, yeah, of course. My apologies. A Andy Bolig with Roars Companies. Uh, we're 2 Carlson Parkway, Plymouth, Minnesota. Thank you. Um, the changes from last time, we did try to relocate the pool to the uh, northeastern side of the site, but ran into setback issues that would have required a variance. So we instead went with a more heavy screening option um, around the current pool. And the other main changes were reducing the building size, so it steps down to the next door neighborhood a little bit more, which did result in a loss of units. Um, but otherwise, we're, I'm happy to stand for any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your work in looking at um, adjustments as well. Are there any questions for the applicant? Yeah, I, I do actually. Anthony, right? Yes. Andy. Andy. Okay. Um, you know, one of the, the sticking points for me has been how this compares to the original visioning study. And if, if you recall, we bring it up, the visioning study we had, you know, two, three buildings, and it, it, the way it was laid out, possibly townhomes, it made a really nice transition, I thought, to residential area. So here we've got you know, one really large building that spanned across there. So can you talk about you know, what factors went into this sort of design versus other options to break it up and maybe make a better transition? Yeah, that's a really good question. It primarily comes down to the zoning and the requirement of units per acre. So the, does my cursor work here? It doesn't, but the, or maybe it does. So the gas pipeline easement is right along the proposed uh, pervious area there. So much of the site is not necessarily buildable. And it, so you're kind of solving for the limiting factor between units, parking stalls, and creating a building. Um, so, I mean, if we break it up, we lose units and we end up not being able to hit the density guidance. Um, so that was the primary motivation for the building being like this. Uh, and we did add quite a few jogs along the building and try to break up the materiality. Um, and our, I mean, our architect is here as well, if you'd like to kind of hear more about that piece of it. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Thank you. Thank you. I believe the landowner is here to speak this evening as well. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Joe Jablonski uh, from 16305 36th Avenue, Plymouth, Minnesota, representing Archon or Akron 42. Um, I'm here tonight as a representative of Akron 42. Just for clarification's sake, Lennar is a part owner of a joint venture in that, so <clears throat> Akron 42 is not solely owned by Lennar. Even though I am a representative of Akron 42, I am an uh, employee of Lennar. You can see my Lennar shirt. Um, but I wanted to make that clear because I think there may be some confusion there that we are representing a joint venture and multiple ownership in this parcel. Um, so. I just wanted to go through and, and maybe clarify some of the background, some of the history, um, and, and what brought forth the, um, the request in July to re-guide it. Um, you know, we've been working on, on the Presswick area for a long time. Um, the preliminary plat came through in 2007. 
um, and this area was designated as commercial <clears throat> up front and originally. And um, we've been marketing it, and obviously we've built, uh, Lennar has built homes around it for a number of communities. Uh, as the uh, parks director was mentioning, Talamore Park and Ellsbury Park and Greystone Park, those are all neighborhoods that we helped build. Um, and one of the problems when we've been marketing the, the commercial piece all along has been there's just not enough residents in the area to make it a valuable or viable commercial option. And part of that is some of the things that are uh, the humor, um, the unknowns that were going on with humor, um, some of the things going on further to the east that you know, there's not a lot of development, so this particular area for commercial has been underserved for a long time. Um, we've been <clears throat> actively marketing it with a broker for over 10 years and really have not gotten any interest whatsoever in it. Um, finally, we, we started to, you know, relook at what else can we do with it, what else can, can go on there. Um, so. We approached the uh, Planning Commission and the City Council about reguiding it, and that was approved in, in July. And the land use designation changed at that point to high density residential. So now we have an active user or a, a user of interest on that property who would like to move forward. <coughs> and we're just looking for your support in that and uh, happy to answer any questions. In, shed any light on uh, answering anything else that we could do to help you out making those decisions. Thank you, Joe. Can you, the, the southern part of the property is zoned as commercial still. Correct. And does Lennar, you've only asked for this northern section to be re-guided um, and now rezoned with this project. Do you, what do you envision for that southern portion? That's a, a great question, Madam Chair. Um, one of the things that did happen very quickly after the zoning designation change is we started to get more interest in the commercial properties. Um, it, it wasn't as big of a user because the size of the space has been condensed, but it, it kind of very quickly started to happen that, okay, now we're starting to see other higher density uses. We're starting to see more residential um, users for the area, so uh, very quickly we started getting interest from convenience store type things, gas station type things, um, daycare type uses. But uh, one of our concerns is, as the landowner is, you know, if, if the high density residential is not there and not part of it, I think the commercial and the interest in the commercial will also um, not go away, but it'll be put on the back burner again. And, you know, we've been working hard on this for a long time, and we really want to see things move forward. And I know you don't have a crystal ball, but with those users you've talked to, do you feel that there is significant interest that we will see projects move forward in the next 12 months with that commercial, or do you think it's going to be another two, three, four years before they move forward? I, I think that depends heavily on, on the, the high-density residential moving forward. Um, I think that if... It does, there will be a user we have been working very closely with somebody that we're working on negotiating contracts with. Um, so I, I think they have a very strong interest in, in joining this site and joining an opportunity here, but um, they're kind of waiting to see what happens and how all of this plays out as well. Okay, thank you. Are there other commissioners with questions for the applicant or the landowner? Thank you. Thank you, Joe. At this time, we would invite any members of the public that would like to come forward and um, comment on this item. Just a recap of the comments we did here at the last meeting um, and the concerns we heard at the last meeting. So um, if you spoke at the last meeting, you do not um, necessarily need to speak again this evening. Um, and the, the concerns we did here were around traffic, parks, screening around the pool, noise, the height of the building, the four stories um, and building height, safety um, with traffic, schools, landscaping, um, the parking, and then the market need. 
And so with that, I will open up the public hearing for anyone that would like to speak on this item this evening. And just a reminder to state your name and address for the record. Absolutely. Good evening, Commission. Uh, my name is Brooke Skin. I am at 14363 Alboro Avenue. I spoke last time about the services and some of the things, and I wanted to give you guys an update. I did a bunch of research in the last month since we were here to let you know kind of how that works. So everybody, like you said, is included in your planning, and you guys are giving great information to the schools, to the police, and to the fire, right? So one of the things I found out from the school department when I talked with Mark, our financial director over there, is that there are two schools planned, but there's no funding for the schools right now. So he would have to go through and get a referendum, and all of the taxpayers that are here currently would have to pay for that referendum to build these new schools to support all of the building that's going on in this corner. So with that said, if that doesn't pass, we don't have a school. Right now the schools in Rosemont are at capacity and over capacity in many of those places. So having three apartment buildings going in within two years, um, the fastest they could get a school open would be fall of maybe 25 if they can get everything passed. So kind of thinking through that process, the police kind of has carte blanche right now to hire as many as they want to, but their issue is hiring. Um, they can't really hire the cops, and so they're having the lowest applications they've ever seen. Um, and with the change of mayor and potentially a change of council um, at the city council level, they may not have that funding to continue to go forward to support all of this. Just um, same thing from a fire and a paramedic perspective. I also called a handful of the daycare centers in town, and it is a two-year wait to get a child into a daycare here. Um, almost a three-year wait if you have an infant. And so when you think about these high densities, I'm not saying that you should necessarily change the zoning of this, but maybe slow down the building in this and see how it goes first and making sure that we have the services to support all these people. Um, not, you know, the transportation, we've talked about that. I know a handful of neighbors that use busing, but they have to drive to Apple Valley to get there. And so if these high density places don't have a lot of cars or people that don't have vehicles, there's not a really easy way for them to get to work or to get into the public transit. So I just wanted to bring those things back to your guys' attention. Um, if you have any further questions for me, let me know. But again, I just wanna let you know, I did do a little bit more research to understand the process um, and to understand that as of right now, if these were to open in 16 months, like um, the other development on the other side said that they could have them up and running 16 to 18 months once it's approved and they have their funding. If they were to do that by January, we wouldn't have the services to support them when they open. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chairwoman, uh, distinguished members of the commission, uh, thank you for your time today. I'm Nick LaBelle, uh, 14260 Aylesbury Court, uh, Rosemount. And uh, I'd like to thank the developer for you know, listening to some of our concerns, but I, I still have some concerns uh, about the, uh, the building itself and screening of the pool. Well, screening and definition matters, right? There's different levels of screen. What does that mean? Is it a solid fence? Is it a fence with certain size opening so um you know that those are some of the things that uh you know i can use buzzwords too but being an engineer being exact matters right so that's nice fluffy story we'll say but without some definition it's that it doesn't mean much to me okay a um, couple of the other things that uh, I'd like to talk about are security. We never really talked about security with this building. Uh, I believe the other project, the uh, Schaefer Richardson project, talked quite nicely about their security and had a wonderful plan. Uh, I've heard yet to hear anything on security for this building. So if, if anything, I'd suggest that developer uh, speak with the, the other developer and get their plan, because that sounds like a pretty good idea. Um, and then also uh, the buffer zone thing. Um, you know, this is, again, we're making that transition, right? There's no, it's a huge step up from two stories to four stories uh, and some of that. And, you know, there was some effort made there, but I still think that originally when it comes to the zoning of the site, we've already been rezoned like, mm, I'm going to say two to three times. So agricultural to residential, which I think was townhomes. And then we went to commercial and now we're up to high density. So we're just kind of making it up as we go along for lack of a better word on that. So is this really the, the best use of that mm -hmm. property? Um, you know, it's, this is really the, the center of geographically of Rosemount, and this makes sense to have commercial here. Uh, so that's 
once we've filled that in with more houses, there, we don't have that space back, right? That means we have to level things to put more resident or more commercial in. So does it make sense to do that? Um, so, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about too, and maybe is more or less a question for a uh, commission here to ask the developers is how they plan to do their market rate. Uh, and I would specifically ask them if they use a software package called uh, Yieldstar by, by a company called RealPage. And if you're not following the news lately, you'll find out that there is collusion going on between all the different uh, apartment buildings, uh, essentially using this same software package to raise rents significantly for those people that are in these market rate apartments. So um, there are several lawsuits going on right now. Um, hate to have uh, another you know, plaintiff, uh, plaintiff to those lawsuits. So some questions you might want to ask before moving forward with this is how they set that market rate and if they're colluding with other uh, businesses on that. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ma Madam Chair, if, if I could, we're going to ask the audience, you can comment on ma'am. The applause, this is not an applause type of an environment. We all understand that you want to applaud and you're going to support what these folks say, but really in this kind of government public setting, we're not here to, to, to do the applause thing. So let's please hold back on the applause just out of the uh, respect for the process and I think it kind of makes it feel a bit more adversarial. So we all know okay. why you folks are here. There's no surprise. So appreciate holding off on the applause. So sorry, please go okay. ahead. Okay. I'd have, um, my name is Katie Nemitz. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I live at 128 um, Alma Avenue. Um, and I have kind of just a general question. So I had heard earlier that um, the notices weren't provided prior to the um, meeting, right, adequately. Was that done prior to the guiding or re-guiding that was done in July? And so I think there would have been probably a lot more residents here if that had been publicly noticed prior to that meeting. Um, one thing that I just wanted to share, and I was looking at the envisioning statement and what this area was originally envisioned for a year or two years ago. And so what I'm seeing in that statement is um, the intersection will be anchored by the recreation center, that there will be state-of-the-art um, state facilities, and then an area for public gathering, right? And a variety of events throughout the year can be held there. Um, surrounding the open space are smaller one to two story commercial buildings with generous sidewalks and patio areas for strolling and sitting. The plan depicts mis mixed use buildings with commercial on the lower level and residential above. So if we keep going back to that envisioning statement, this was not what necessarily was envisioned there. When I look at the actual language that's on the website, that's not what's there, okay? The other piece or just observation on that envisioning statement would be that there was a park at the top where the retaining ponds are listed on that, um, that chart what I saw earlier. And so that's the only piece that I would just bring to everyone's um, notice. So thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. My name is Kevin Zock. I live at 14301 Aylesbury Avenue. Uh, last time I, hear, I was here, I was pretty fired up, um, but that really just came from wanting the best for my community uh, and the safety of the people who live around me and for me and my wife. So really, the two main areas that I was concerned with before were, um, again, safety. So really, from a traffic standpoint, how are the kids and the families going to be safe walking around if there's increased traffic? Um, so with that, I would ask, what's the plan, uh, not only on the traffic from a vehicle standpoint, from a, but from a pedestrian standpoint as well? And then my other big issue was the transition plan. Um, these single family homes to uh, this four story building uh, does not really fit in that comprehensive plan. So I would ask, uh, what really does that transition look like if this goes through? Are those trees mature? Um, is there a way to put in more obstacles, more screening, something to maybe really try to make that transition more clear? Um, and in addition to that, um, the parks I had a question about, but Dan, um, I'll say our nieces love Aylesbury Park. Um, so it's, I mean, it, I want everyone to be able to enjoy them. Um, so as long as that's being thought through, that's great. Um, from a schooling standpoint, uh, a lot of people come to Rosemount to start their family because they, Rosemount has great schools. And I don't want that to change, right? My, my wife and I are planning on hopefully starting a family and we wanna you know, be in a place with great school system and 
to me, you know, it's, it, it's hard to just keep something at that level. If, you, if we're adding all these residents um, and trying to build new schools, how are we going to pay for great teachers, you know, the resources, everything else that's needed um, in that department? So I'd ask what the plan is there as well. And then my last question would be, I keep hearing about the, the lifetime, and I would ask, um, you know, how does this plot itself affect that lifetime plan that's uh, going in as well? So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the commission. My name is Clayton Miracle. I live at 14388 Alma Avenue. Currently with 269 signatories of our petition <clears throat> to quote, oppose any rezoning of this plat for high density residential purposes, end quote, it is clear and obvious as to the desires and wishes of the residents directly impacted by the decisions that all of you will make. While we appreciate your commission addressing our concerns, raised in the last planning meeting and taking these concerns into consideration, make no mistake that it is our goal that you all vote to not recommend any type of rezoning of the plot in question from commercial to high density residential. We simply desire that the city keep its original commitment to the area and the residents impacted as laid out in the 2040 comprehensive plan. Please put forward whatever motions necessary to prevent any rezoning of the plot in question from commercial to high density residential. Thank you, and we hope the commission does right by its fellow residents. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Commission, uh, Madam Chairman, and members of the commission. Um, my name is Evan Caesar. I live at 14300 Aylesbury Avenue, uh, right across the street from the proposed development. Uh, the only really question or comment I have is um, the developer mentioned that they were having trouble getting commercial in here because of the lack of residential. Well, from this meeting, we just approved a new high-density high residential right up the road within a block, and then in the next 18 months, there's a 1,000 homes going right across 42. Um, so how would the development answer, once that is built, will that be enough to sell some commercial real estate there in this plot there. Um, I would hesitate to hastily evolve this plan until all the other approved plans are developed and then we can see what happens commercially from there. I think that'd be wise. So, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience wishing to speak on this item this evening? Good evening and thank you for listening to my concern. I spoke last time. My name is Idolio Oliva. I'm at 14277 L3 Avenue. And uh, my family and I were first time homeowners. We were born and raised in a different country and we're uh, absolutely thankful for the opportunity to live here and own a home, which is an American dream for a lot of people and it's for us. And so we did a lot of uh, research to find the best place to live and we found that Rosemont was that place for our family. Um, and I want to echo, um, uh, some of the comments regarding childcare. So I have three boys. I have a 16-month-old boy, and it's really hard to find daycare in Rosemont. And you want to keep them here, but it's really hard. So I don't know if uh, in the traffic analysis, there's counts of how many trips I make, because I work in Minneapolis and I commute back and forth. I have to drop off three kids sometimes to be able to come back home and drive them again for soccer back and forth. So I don't know if my neighbors across the street will see, but we drive like crazy. We put it more than 30,000 miles uh, uh, a year. And we do it because we choose to live in Rosemont. So I just want to make sure that, again, a lot of the needs are met for a lot of the residents that will be coming, because this will be a really uh, severe problem, in my opinion. I also have a background living in high dense communities, and I know it is trouble, especially for safety. So I want to make sure that, again, that's being addressed. So if we're going to be welcoming uh, more residents, that's enough. There's enough safety uh, provided for everyone living, so the current residents and the new residents as well. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the... Hi, my name is Mike Polsky. I live at 14176 Aylesbury Avenue. I wasn't uh, able to attend the last meeting, so this is my first opportunity to speak to you. I also think that uh, 
this project, the, this rezoning motion has to be looked at differently than it did last meeting because now you have approved to put 305 units kitty corner. You know, it's, it's kitty corner from where you're proposing to rezone this. Um, in July of 2021, you changed the comprehensive plan. I just tried to Google it quick. I, I would be shocked if it didn't have anything to do with the lifetime fitness announcement that they were coming. And that, that alone spurs interest. Development spurs development. So the first person to come forward with a plan is high density and it's a viable plan. I'm not saying it's not, but it's not zoned for that. We haven't given, truly given it an option to, to become commercialized. Uh, Commissioner Rivera stated at the last meeting that the center of Rosemount is DCTC. There is a lot of space in Rosemount that has not been developed. The, I would think the natural development is going to go south and east. Development will come. For you to change this zoning because you have a, a plan on the table, I think is wrong. I mean, it was said earlier. Give it, give the opportunity for what you just approved earlier to get going. For all the other single family, I believe there's there's more high density coming uh, uh, south of 42. There's a lot of people coming. Some quick numbers that I think are very relevant. You just approved 305 units. You are gonna vote on whether or not to appro approve 212 units. That's a total of 517 units. Times that by two and you get to 1,000. If you do the math, you are gonna increase Rosemount's population by 4%. You're gonna increase the population by 4% at the corner of Akron and Connemara. That's just wrong. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Sarah Sidwell and my address is 14129 Abercorn Avenue. I debated whether or not I would speak tonight, but I think it is critical because all of my counterparts and other people here are from the area immediately adjacent. We live in the Prestwick neighborhood that is immediately to the north of Connemara and to the west of Akron. And I know that this was discussed at the last meeting, but I am, I want to bring up the issue of, and this is in light of what was just approved in terms of the other um, you know, 300 units, and the conversations about park and traffic and green space, because we are in a different position. Prestwick, the northern part, was built without a park. And I want you to consider whether or not, it's not just about the number of people at a park and the placement, it's access. I have a daughter who I brought tonight, and we are, and everybody in that very, very large area are cut off from park access. The folks on the other side, they have the park without crossing any busy streets. In order for us to access a park, we have to cross Akron. And I invite you and encourage you to come and watch the intersection of 141, which is how we have to access an Akron, um, if you want to go to Greystone. I would also encourage you at busy periods of the day to come and look at Connemara and traffic. My daughter is unable to safely access these parks, as is anybody in that Prestwick neighborhood, because we have to cross those busy streets. So I would certainly question, Connemara has a flashing traffic walk, uh, crosswalk, which people routinely ignore. I've almost been hit while I was pushing our neon-colored burly with my daughter in it on multiple occasions. People go 50 instead of the, the zone 40, 40, 45 there. Um, Akron has no traffic control devices. If you, as a, a child or an adult, want to get across to Greystone, you have to cross all of Akron with no traffic control device. It is extremely troubling to me that we are focusing on just traffic and placement and density without actually looking at access um, and that there's a very large neighborhood which is cut off from green space 
and parks without having to cross very busy streets. So I would certainly ask the commission and ultimately the council what they intend to do in terms of creating traffic control devices or other things that are going to keep our children safe. Um, and the other thing I would just reiterate, I'm troubled by the owners um, relying on, without providing any facts whatsoever, that the interest, the commercial interest now is solely based on this plan. When again, Lifetime was announced, Umore was sold, and the other thing was approved. Um, to say without any support whatsoever that this potential rezoning is what's driving the commercial interests without any additional facts. As I'm a lawyer, I trade in facts, and I think that I'm extremely troubled by the commission relying on that statement without any additional support for that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience this evening that would like to speak on this item? Good evening, um, I'm Christina Powell. I live at 14240 Aylesbury Court. Um, I just want to emphasize two things. I mean, one, I think you've talked about the juxtaposition of single family homes to all of a sudden this four story building. I mean, I'm gonna look out my window and just see a four story building. That's all I can see. I can't see anything else when I look out my window. I think it makes more sense if you can gradually get up to that, right? Um, I think the other point then is about commercial. Um, I don't really think there's much commercial east of Highway 3, right? I mean, the, where do you go? There's no gas stations until you get to 3. So most of the time, if I need to go, I'll get gas when I go to work in Invergrove Heights, or I'll stop at the store in Invergrove Heights somewhere else because there's nothing by my house to stop for to get. So I think it makes more sense to have more commercial available for people to stop or to run out from their house to get something real quick at night if they need something or to get gas and not have to go to a different city just to go to the gas station or something like that. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the commission, I'm Tina Anger. I live at 14276 Aylesbury Avenue. Um, and I just wanted to highlight, again, the draw of living in Rosemount. And, and one of those key things is this small town, hometown feel that Rosemount has. And as we consider this plot of land, um, this is really our opportunity to um, create an, a community connection point, a place where we don't always have to rely on Central <clears throat> Park um, for all of our community events. I know our community means a lot to all of us here, and I would love to see not only commercial opportunity, but additional space together as a community and continue to build what we love so much about living here. So um, I just hope that you guys consider um, more community space. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to speak on this item this evening? Seeing none, I will make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner Kenniger, seconded by Commissioner Reed. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Public hearing is now closed. Um, so we heard some of the same concerns um, that we heard last time again, um, and some new feedback on, on the plan. I know, Anthony, we've got some additional staff here to help, help with these. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts that, of stuff you wrote on that you want to start by responding to or if you want me to go through my list? Yeah, I can speak to a couple of the comprehensive planning questions. Um, Thank you. Let's see here. Uh, just to note, the, the visioning study for the site and the area is just that. It's a concept. Uh, it did not go through the um, analysis that an application for development goes through. Uh, so, um, you know, take that into account when understanding what the, the project before you is versus what might have been um, put together uh, and then consider the land uses of those sites. Um, with regards to high density residential, the comprehensive plan uh, does identify high density residential as compatible with almost all uses except industrial and that um, care should be taken to provide buffering which can be can, uh, uh, done in using distance or landscaping. Um, the, the site here itself, there's 
quite a bit of space between the actual houses due to this pipeline. On the other side of Abbey Field Avenue, uh, there's a significant buffer between the building and the houses. It's not next door on the parcel adjacent to any single family homes. Um, additionally, screening, uh, the, co the city code specifically uh, says screening can, can be uh, done using landscaping, berming, distance, uh, the applicant's choice to use landscaping. Um, I don't know if they have a plan to provide some uh, 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 walls around it, around the pool. Um, but again, uh, typically the, the city code doesn't require any screening of a swimming pool, and I think if you would uh, look throughout the city, there's a lot of swimming pools uh, a lot closer to houses than this one. Um, regarding future development and where it's going to occur, um, you know, to the east uh, is land owned by Flint Hills. The only development they've indicated that they would allow for development is, is industrial and business park in nature. Uh, additionally, the eastern side of DCTC is guided for business park and industrial uses in that part of the Umore area. Um, south of DCTC is contaminated, uh, and also the area with Dakota aggregates is being mined until 2040. Um, so just kind of some responses to the comments the Planning Commission received. Um, the reguiding of the site occurred prior to uh, the application for the project that was uh, previously reviewed. Um, let's see, is there anything else? Here, um, security, that's a question for the applicant. I can't, can't answer that one. Um, and then I think, you know, with regards to schooling and police, I would defer to our city administrator. He's having those conversations with the school district and the police department. Um, and then, um, I guess, just transportation and safety. I would defer to our public works director as well as the county, um, the county being the jurisdiction over Akron Avenue and their um, decision making process for improvements to the roads that are under their control uh, as well as uh, our public works director with regards to improvements to roads uh, that are under the city's control. Did I miss anything? Thank you. I, no, but I think you covered um, most everything that I have at the moment. I just wondered if you could, if you have available a map to show us. So I know when we did the envisioning, I think maybe you were just on it, or that one works too. We we envisioned commercial, some residential here with some commercial. And I know we've had lots of discussions on the, the first floor commercial and um, residential above it. And while that was a, a vision at one point, it doesn't appear to be a real market, um, something that we, that developers want to do um, because there's not much of a market for it. So, you know, in terms of this, we still do have lots of commercial at this corner, um, correct? No, Madam Chair, there's a commercial guided in the southwest quadrant. Uh, the southern portion of the site is still guided for commercial. Uh, this entire area is guided for commercial as well as some east of the DCTC uh, property, the DCTC and Emerald Isle property. Additionally, the land use plan does have uh, commercial, uh, commercially guided land at 145th and County Road 42, and then of course the area uh, immediately east of Highway 3 has some commercially guided land. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, maybe I can add to a few of the points that Anthony brought up, um, responding to some of the comp plan comments. Um, just note that the Rosemont Port Authority, the, um, the board tasked with economic development uh, review under their, um, their guidance has been very aware of the amount of commercial acreage, high density acreage, and other land uses that comprise the, the city of Rosemont. They've taken a very active role over the past, I'll say, six months or so, um, making sure that there is adequate supply within there. Um, and the other piece as it relates to our comprehensive land use planning right now, we're operating under a 2040 land use plan as required by Met Council that gets updated every 10 years. So one thing to consider or note that as a part of that is that um, I know there were some comments made about how this continues to evolve and you know when, when and how does it stop changing. Um, it is reviewed and assessed and there are changes made um, actively every 10 years as a part of that long-range planning as communities grow, especially in this area of Dakota County within Rosemont, um, that those adjustments are made on that 10-year cycle. 
Uh, within the comp planning process, um, there is allowance for amendments to those comp plans. That's something that was referenced earlier, and that's what was done on the northern portion of this site to accommodate this type of development. So these are all actions that are occurring within the cities, uh, approved not only by Rosemont and its elected leaders, but also Met Council, which maintains the purview over um, uh, long-range planning within um, the Twin Cities area. Thank you. I think, Anthony, um, we covered the comments that, um, from a planning perspective, Logan, can we ask you to speak a little bit on the, the schools and your conversations with the school and how that works um, and what, what our responsibility is tied to that as well as the safety? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, as the Commission. Uh, I will give the first gal that spoke in the White Swatter credit. Uh, she's very accurate in what she uh, researched and found out from the school's perspective. Uh, we meet with them, uh, I would say, probably twice, twice uh, every two months, every three months at the, at the longest, uh, to both share plans like this, to talk about their long-term vision to respond to population growth in the city. And um, you're exactly right that they need to and intend to come to taxpayers with a bond referendum um, this fall. Uh, potentially this summer, or there's a couple statutory times where school districts can do those bond questions. I think it might be May and, and August, but I might be getting those incorrect. Um, so very quickly, and then you're exactly right that once that is approved or is not approved, then they would kick into high gear the design and construction process of, of the properties. And so um, the city's purview is to share with them th these types of plans, to be transparent in what we see in our comprehensive plan, they have a demographer that they talk to a lot when you watch school board meetings and, and, and as they project out. They know, for example, the amount of kids that would live in a traditional Falmore Glen or Presswick home as compared to the amount of kids that might come out of a, of a unit or a family that would more likely choose to live in a market rate apartment complex. There's a lot of de demography and demographic science behind that and so they rely a lot on types of uses, types of mix of uses. Um, and from what I've gleaned from their demographer and their staff, single family, of course, produces more students than, than a market rate apartment um, would. It's certainly not no students coming out of here, but it produces, a, a single family home would, would produce more students um, and would likely be of, of an increased focus or concern, I would say, for them. We were really pleased and are really pleased that they own land just north of here at Akron and Bonaire. Um, it is contingent upon getting it approved by the voters. I would say one of the comments that um, I don't know if it was Kevin or somebody made about, about kind of um, getting that approved and what it, what it takes to get that approved. Um, certainly an argument could be made that uh, the impact on taxpayers is lessened by the infusion of a couple of, of highly tax generating um, apartment complexes. So the question to residents when a vote were to go to them, uh, the calculation that's going to be done in the publication to residents to say impact on a homeowner, it'll be lessened by the fact that there's a broader tax base upon which to spread taxes. Um, so just an anecdote to say that this does potentially help, certainly helps the school district generate more tax revenue and potentially generates an, a, a greater ability to get a bond referendum approved. But yes, they own land on the north side. They have an option to purchase land on the south side, um, they have told us that you know Rosemont Middle School is is in need of an expansion, um, where they would build a new Rosemont Middle School, um, and we've got a parcel of land that they, we are talking with them about for that property. So I think folks understand it's it's fairly straightforward. It certainly isn't our responsibility, you know, to build schools. We're not the school board, but we also can't shirk the reality that the schools and 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 the need to provide schools is a, is a crucial role of of government period, whether your school or county the, or city, the, the resident on the ground doesn't really care and we're not allowed to point fingers at each other. We all, we all are in it together. It is going to be their job to get, it, to get that done um, and we will support them however we can um, on that front. Um, and yeah, maybe before I jump to other topics, I could, I could take any follow-up questions on the school comment if I, I didn't cover it correctly or thoroughly. I am good. Are there any questions around schools from the commission? Thank you. Just, I wanted to, Madam Chair, just keep going then a little bit while I've got the, the proverbial mic on the police and fire side of, of, of the conversation. Um, again, strong support from the city council and, and city staff. Budget support has never wavered for the police and fire departments. 
Um, the, the fire department budget specifically has grown exponentially, appropriately so, over, over the last number of years. You know, we are really fortunate to have a paid on call, um, what we often call volunteer fire department, but they're a paid on call fire department with no full-time employees, and um, they are able to respond to and support our city of 27,000, which is a really impressive feat. Um, confident that they can handle these types of uses. Um, we communicate with them. They are both the police chief and fire chief um, are, are a part of our development review committee and our processes to review these types of proposals. Um, police chief specifically um, is at the table for all of these conversations. And as, as uh, again was mentioned, the city council has kind of um, verbalized a support for at least one officer every year as um, housing density and population growth density continues on this same projection. Um, it is hard to hire officers, but it's not impossible. We are not not hiring them. Uh, I think the, di the, the issue, um, full transparency, is we maybe used to get 100 applicants. We now get 20, but we still get an officer, and, and we do not lower our standards. Um, the pool is just narrowed, but the pool is, is out there. We are a highly supportive community of police. We are a good paying. A community for our police officers and so we do get applicants that want to come here because I just would argue you know uh, and we hear it from our officers that they love the community support the hellos at the at the sandwich shops and the purchased coffee at the gas stations and you're likely not to get that in in, in St. Paul or Minneapolis or some of the more uh, challenging cities and so that reflects back to them and makes them want to come here they tell their friends that they went to college with to come to Rosemount because it's a supportive community um, those types of things so it does help us in recruiting in recruiting officers and um, we have a really strong culture in our department that folks want to be a part of the forthcoming police building is a really big draw as we talk to applicants as well that they're going to get to operate out of a, a state-of-the-art public work or a police and public works campus so anyways not to go down that rabbit hole but uh, confident that the public safety um, service provisions are, are, are going to remain very strong and continue to be the number one um, ranked service in our community surveys year over year. Public safety is public schools, probably number one. We don't survey that quite as much in our survey. Uh, public safety is, is the number one reason why people um, are proud to be in Rosemount, like to live in Rosemount, and we're certainly not going to change, change that. So. Um, and then maybe quickly, I just wanted to give a, maybe a bit of a broader kind of explanation on maybe where, just from my chair hearing the council's conversation, both in work sessions and at the city council meeting when the comp plan reguiding happened for this parcel. Uh, I think Joe from, from Lennar would, would, would echo this and his predecessors at Lennar for years and years would echo. Lennar has been coming to the city for 15 years or more asking to put housing on this entire parcel. Um, and we have said no to housing on this entire parcel. I've, I've been here since 2017. Predecessors before me have said no to housing on this parcel for over a decade. Um, because this parcel is seen as our, these, this quadrant, three sides, not including DCTC, is, the, is a prime quadrant in, this, in the city. And so we've been protecting this land use for a very long time and telling Lennar not to bring housing projects to the city on this parcel for a very long time because of the need to protect it for the retail that we know the community wants. The city council is adamant. You'll hear, you'll hear them say plan or goal one, two, and three is retail, right? And so I, I can hear what the crowd would want to say, right, is, well, now you're giving up, right, and, you're, and you let them come in with this parcel. Understand that. I would, I would surmise to the, to the residents that, that are here or would listen in the future, um, this is a reflection of post-Amazon, post-COVID, deliver at home in, in, in four hours or two days, market reality. So the notion of an entire corner being anchored by big box or medium box retail is a thing of Burnsville Mall days or or Cedar in 42 days in Apple Valley, it doesn't exist any longer in the, in the retail marketplace. What is the new normal in the retail marketplace is retail anchored by a density provider, which is exactly what we're doing here. So I think from a staff perspective who study this stuff and, and, and do this for a living, we see this as an opportunity to bring to the community the type of retail market-driven, density anchored opportunity that is what 
is the new normal in, again, a post-Amazon reality. Um, and so, uh, again, I think that's, I just wanted to give that, give that history and then kind of how that juxtaposes with Lifetime. Um, Lifetime is very bullish on the site, but you also heard them say at a public meeting, if you watched when they spoke, the site is still soft. The market for Lifetime to be here is still soft. Um, they are coming because it's a great partnership that we've struck with Lifetime, but on a per capita potential membership market, it is, does not check all the boxes that Lifetime needs. So they are watching both of these proposals with very close focus and are also not certain that their entire side can handle being straight retail either. So the notion, I, I just share that again, uh, probably talking too much here, but I, I just, I, I feel the need that now is the time to kind of communicate this to the community of how kind of granularly we look at these things, um, that, that it, it's, it's a different marketplace. I know that Akron is very busy and we are very proud of what's happening on the east side of town, but I think you guys that live out there realize there is nothing past where development is right now. Th this parcel is not more than a couple blocks from a, a piece of property, as Anthony mentioned, that is going to stay vacant forever. It's going to be grass and solar panels owned by Flint Hills forever. Um, and so you'll hear retailers talk about needing a 360 degree pull in a certain drive time. We will never achieve that northeast of here very far because it's going to be owned by Flint Hills in perpetuity southeast of here, owned by DCTC in perpetuity, south, further south contamination, further south mining. So the, the strength of the corner, while really strong, and the signal light makes it really strong, and lifetime makes it really strong, and your folks' developments make it really strong, it still isn't nearly as strong as many retailers would want it to see. Um, so again, overshare, talking too much, but uh, just wanted to, uh, to help uh, answer some questions and, and maybe um, take some some air out of the room a little bit so but anyways yeah thank you logan um adam i don't know if you want to address or if anthony wants to address there was the question on um the notices for the public hearing on the reguiding and i don't know if we have data on that um madam chair we don't have anything specific on that action in front of us tonight since that occurred several months ago i mean it's certainly something that we will always continue to look into to make sure that our public notification system is working as intended i know some of the comments we heard from residents at the last meeting have already sparked some good internal discussion about um, not just the legal requirements that we have to provide public notice on certain types of development applications, but also some best practices that we can further employ to make sure that the residents are um, in the know and un understanding um, development applications that are occurring um, near them. Um, and, you know, kind of, I'll take Logan's word, you know, maybe to overshare a little bit there, but just because um, we have met our legal obligation to provide notice with an X number of feet. We still hear from people who say, I didn't know about that. That doesn't change the reality that they didn't know about it, even though we met our legal requirements. Their reality is still very valid and their perception is still very valid. So other ways that we can do better to communicate that out, um, that's a bit marketing, that's a bit how we do public hearing notification processes, all things that we're continuing to review and try to make improvements on. I would add to uh, to everyone listening or, or in the audience that you can sign up for uh, email alerts so you get uh, a link to every city meeting that you would like sent to your email when they're put out. Um, you know, we definitely want people to attend uh, our public hearings, and I would say that the reguiding there was res there were residents, and they expressed a lot of the same concerns that the folks here tonight have expressed as well. Thank you, Anthony. Um, I think there's two more things that I have on my my notes, um, and then I'll open up to commissioners for questions. The there was a lot of comments around um, child care, um, accessibility to child care, which obviously is is not something that we can um, control if people want to or are willing to open up child care facilities, but um, that is something that would fit in the commercial areas of these areas, correct? Right, daycare centers are permitted within our commercial, C4 commercial zoning, as well as uh, 
also in our business park zoning district. Uh, additionally, uh, home daycares are a permitted use in our residential districts as well. Um, you know, there's there's a, there are conditional use in our in our public institutional. Uh, a lot of places of worship have a daycare in them as well. Um, and I don't think a shortage of daycare centers or child care is um, unique to Rosemount in any way. Um, and then I had one more. Oh, um, Nick, can you kind of address some of the concerns around the pedestrian crossings and the safety with the roads? And I don't know if it's if you or if it's the representative from Dakota County that could maybe speak to some of that? Probably some of each, Madam Chair and okay. Commissioners. Thank you. Um, yes, and, and I know that uh, I've been here approximately a year, so I don't have the deep history on when everything came to be and went in and so forth. And in particular, what I'm kind of referring to by that is uh, the flashing beacon crossing at Connemara and Abbey Field. I think that was roughly within the last two years. But those sorts of improvements are made after... Uh, taking into account what we're seeing for concentrations of pedestrian uh, usage of these spaces. We want to uh, make sure that there is a built-up demand, if you will, to use any particular crossing before we're enhancing it to that degree. And this, that situation was one of those that met that sort of criteria, and so that was put in there. Uh, it, it would be something that the city can consider elsewhere in town and perhaps it's some of the evolution that is an outcome of after these projects go in if there is a, a pent-up demand or an apparent demand to cross abbey field perhaps that could be a candidate for something like that uh, we really have to see where people are are focusing on their routing i know there's going to be a couple of different ways to get to and from say ellsbury park or other locations in and through the area so that something we keep an eye on um, thanks for bringing forward the, the concern that uh, it, it appears some motorists maybe aren't uh, heeding the, the warning or the signal there when, when folks have pressed the button and see the beacon going. It's uh, certainly something we would share with our uh, law enforcement, police department to uh, maybe spend some additional time there and observe that. and provide warnings or instruction or even ticketing if necessary for violations of that. That's the kind of feedback that we need. And uh, so we would work with them to, to help step that up. Uh, there may be an opportunity as well to implement something along those lines on Akron Avenue, although I, I don't want to speak for Dakota County in terms of their process and how they would entertain such a concept. Uh, that's what I know we have Erin Labrie in the audience here. She's the county engineer and could speak to that in more detail. But things of that nature, both uh, perhaps a little bit further north on Akron or even at the Connemara intersection as part of an evolution of uh, traffic control changes that might be instigated by the continuation of growth in the area uh, are things that the county and city collaborate on and work together on. And uh, for instance, in taking in a lot of these, uh, well, these, these traffic analyses that have been presented by the developers for these projects as well as others in this immediate area, city and county are going to embark on a little bit deeper dive on that as to what it means for uh, more detail on what sort of implementations will come about at intersections and key points in this area given now that we know that these types of projects are much more of a reality. Uh, you know, we have the comprehensive plan and some of the, the setups for roadway network have, have all come about based on projected land use and zoning. And that doesn't get quite to the heart of the details of what exactly those projects will be and what exactly they will generate for trips to and from. Uh, those are the types of details that we need to be able to to give a, a much more robust uh, projection and forecast and uh, warrant analysis, if you will, to determine what types of solutions and when in time uh, it is justifiable to implement them. So I think I'll stop there on that. And uh, if I could invite uh, Aaron to the podium maybe to speak on the Akron Avenue component of all this, uh, if she would. Thank you, Nick. 
Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. My name is Erin Labrie. I'm the County Engineer with Dakota County at 14955 Galaxy Avenue in Apple Valley. Um, so yes, this county and city have been working closely together as these developments um, have come forward to the city. We've been reviewing the traffic studies, looking at what impacts there are to the county system. Um, there is sufficient capacity currently on Akron at Connemara to handle the, the traffic generation that is being planned with the developments that are being considered right now. But as, as development continues to grow, we will continue to work with the city looking at those traffic impacts and at some point maybe a, a traffic control such as a roundabout or a signal would become warranted at Connemara. And so once we reach that point, that is something that we can program. We can program a, a, an improvement project for that. Um, and so as these developments come to fruition and are built and we have destinations for both vehicles and pedestrians and bicycles, looking at the needs on the system as well as what type of pedestrian crossings may be needed. Um, those are things that will work with the city as well as the developers, looking at that in the traffic study. So we're working in concert. This is on our radar. As we know, there's a lot of development happening in the city and we'll work um, to monitor it and to make plans um, when uh, improvements are warranted. When you, if you could speak just a little bit uh, from the pedestrian side, you mentioned that you're monitoring the development, and so does that mean you're that as the development goes in, you're looking actively at the pedestrian crossings, or are you waiting? Do we wait until we have more movement and and we've got more people you going that you look at it? Like and I'm just trying to guess, like when when Lifetime gets built or when. We have the commercial and the apartments go in. Do we have to wait for those pedestrian crossings for a while, or is that something that you, you're able to put in sometime shortly after the development is built? Yeah, I mean, those types of improvements um, have a short time frame as far as design to implementation. So when they are warranted, that is something that we can work with the city on and move relatively quickly on. So once the demand is there and we determine what the appropriate treatment might be and where it might be located, um, that is something we could definitely and is, work on. Is the demand based on population and when the population gets built, when the apartments get built in this case? Um, yep, I mean, it's looking the at the capacity. destination, it's looking at the traffic on Akron, how difficult it is to cross. cross. Um, okay. Really, it's about destinations and where people want to go and walk to and bike to and how, what safety improvements might be needed. Okay, thank you. Is there any questions from the commission for Aaron from traffic? It's always a topic. It's always okay. a hot topic at our meetings. <laughs> Thank you. Their projects. Thank you. I think I, Anthony, I think I covered everything that, the notes that I took. Are there any questions from the commissioners or the commissioners make any notes from the public hearing that I missed? Commissioner I, Reed. There was at least, I think, one question that, that came up um, was around the buffer um, and so the the adjacent uh, I can't remember the name of the street there um, but the adjacent area across the street where there's we call the buffer um, are there any opportunities there for landscaping or doing anything to create a more natural buffer between the residential and the high density uh, um, Commissioner Reed uh, are you talking about on the west side of Abbey yes, Field on the yes, side closer Abbey to the Field, homes you, yes um, well, I think, you know, there may be an opportunity. Uh, I know the pipelines do have some concerns about fill and things like that. Um, certainly on, on the residential properties uh, within their easements. Um, certainly it's something that might be considered. Um, I know it's kind of hit or miss whether the residents actually want it and um, if, if the pipeline would allow it. It's not something that we necessarily could require as a condition of approval as it's not owned by the applicant. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, uh, boulevard trees and things like that are, are required for all high density residential developments. The west side of Abbey Field does have boulevard trees currently. Um, I think, you know, there's other parts similar to what you see along 42 as buffering there. But typically those, those buffers are for traffic 
noise, things like that, versus um, a residential use. Can you put the landscape plan up maybe just, I, I'm thinking to see the buffer that, yeah. that is there would be helpful. So this specific area is the pipeline easement. So there isn't an ability to plant trees over that. Um, but this area here, uh, there's the boulevard trees placed as well as some interior uh, between the, the um, boulevard trees in the building. And you can see they're staggered to provide a little bit more coverage uh, between those two. Um, so that's what the, the landscape plan shows there. And, and as I noted earlier, the, the additional trees placed around the pool area as well. So it looks like there's, there's an easement on the west side of Abbey Field, though, mm -hmm. too, that would limit any additional trees by the residents who live there? Right, right. Okay. It kind of shifts from the, from the northeast and then crosses the road and then goes to the other side of Abbey Field. But we do have a fair, it does appear that there's a fair amount of buffering and landscaping that the developer is going to do mm -hmm. against the building with the exception of that one area where the pipeline easement goes. Correct, Madam Chair. And the, the uh, scale of the parking on the site really pushes those trees to the edges, which kind of helps add that uh, visual screening and buffering. Um, you know, when, when we look at this landscape plan, Anthony, I mean, it, it, and, and this view, it looks, oh, it looks like it almost screens it completely. But in, in practice, um, what, what is the expectation? I recall the height of these trees or width of these trees. Are these going to be short conifers? Are these going to be tall trees? I, do you recall? Right. So the coniferous trees, uh, they're a minimum of six feet in height, and those are kind of the more spiky circles here. The um, the uh, deciduous trees along the boulevards, those have a, the minimum planting size of two and a half inches for their caliper inches for their base. Uh, that's the city code requirement for landscape planning. Um, in discussions with other landscape architects, um, planting a larger tree doesn't necessarily mean you get a bigger tree faster. It just the smaller trees catch up to the to a bigger tree that's mm -hmm. planted, um, and so you know the. We really are just reviewing it against the code requirements for, for trees planted. But the minimums are six feet for coniferous trees and two and a half caliper inches for uh, deciduous trees. <clears throat> and you might have said this and I messed up, but two and a half inches equates to roughly? I mean, oh, I mean, I think if you go out to our newer developments, it's any of the new trees that you see in a brand new house. Um, you know. Yes. So they're they're going to be six to eight feet as well. Yeah, pro I guess. I, I mean, that's what I'm saying, like roughly something yeah. in that neighborhood. Madam Chair, maybe I can just just add on to that too, and that's a question that often comes up as well. Why can't we plant much larger trees to help screen immediately? And in discussions with again landscape architects, you know, the viability of the the tree surviving that type of a transplant when it's already that mature is very low. So that's that's why the the city code is set at that two and a half caliper inches where it is. To try, I, seen other cities where those caliper injuries are actually smaller. So um, it, it, it feels like this, the, the way the code is written here is to maximize the viability of those trees surviving, being planted there, while also trying to get the largest type of tree um, at the time of development. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the commission at this time? Um, I just have a question on the building itself. Um, I don't know if it's for you, Anthony, or the applicant. Um, there. Um, so where are the mechanical units in on site? Is it on the roof or is it somewhere else on site? So the city code requires mechanical units to be placed so that they're not visible from the ground. Uh, typically they're placed behind, behind the parapet walls and things like that. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you exactly where they are. Um, our planner, Julia, did the review of this one um, more in depth like that. But uh, typically that's the requirement that when we get the building permits, we look for to make sure we know where, the, where those units are going. Okay. And, and I would expect them to be on the roof. Okay. So the reason I ask is I'm seeing the heavier, um, uh, I guess, the parapet wall and the, the wall cap that's being... Um, heavier in certain areas and it possibly has to do with maybe screening, it's part screening. But you know, as a way of making the building look, look less massive and less imposing, maybe it's, I um, was going to ask if there's a way to try to bring it down a little bit, maybe in terms of color or 
just the entire size of the element. But that was more of a question. Sure. Thank you. Andy, do you want to come up and address that question or someone from your staff? I think we've got a question on the mechanical units and then as well as some of the some of the components of the building that are deeper that are more massed if there's Apologies, we didn't hear the question too well, yeah, so you might but, need to clarify. Uh, Petromagets, Cost Wilson Architects, 1301 American Boulevard, Bloomington. Thank you. Could you, um, I apologize, could you repeat your mechanical question again? Sure, my question was if your mechanical uh, systems are located on the rooftop. So for the corridor air, uh, yes it is, and then for the individual units, they're actually magic packs, yes. and they're turned on the side of the bays, and then the grills are color matched to the materials. Sure. So, um, and the reason I ask is um, I just see in certain areas the heavier uh, parapet wall cap or the cornice or... In terms of the darker material The darker the material. It, it, um, I understand it's part of your, uh, how you're trying to articulate the building, but it's mm -hmm. also making the building look more massive from the single family home side. Yeah, we can so explore other colors. Is that something that you can lighten up? Yeah, we can explore other colors, of course. That was the only question. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Thank you. I, or you might, you might want to stay yeah. up, so I have some more questions for you. Yeah, Just stay in hand. Yeah. Uh, there are a couple other questions. One about the, the pool screening, yeah. a little more specifics about that. Yeah, and sorry, I wasn't trying to use buzzwords. It, I hear you from the engineering perspective. So by code, it's a six-foot metal fence. And then, um, let's see, I'm not going to be able to find the landscape plan. Oh, here it is. So we have arbor that fully screen it. Um, and from a resident and use perspective, people don't like, especially how close we are to the road, they don't want to feel visible around a pool. So it is, we do our best to fully screen. We don't want anyone to be able to see our residents when they're at the pool. Andy, what are your typical hours for pools at your facilities? Um, generally, it depends on the municipality, but we typically would, uh, for sure, I mean, sunset, you can't use the pool after that. And then if there are issues with anything, we set specific hours and, um, you can even limit the usage and have a sign-up system if it becomes a popular pool. Most of the time in the suburbs, the pools aren't used as too much and people just lounge around them. There, there was, and thank you, there was another question about security, because I mean, we had yeah. compared, yeah. And I, I apologize, I couldn't hear Schaefer Richardson's presentation, but we um, obviously value security. So during construction, the site's fully monitored 24 seven by an active individuals. Um, and then during operations, it's fully secured, so no one can get into the building. Uh, during business hours, we have on-site management that buzz people in, otherwise it's up to residents. Um, but we have smart lock systems, security cameras throughout the building, monitoring, um, you know, secure access everywhere. So the typical security. Oh, I mean, yeah, we do, um, from a resident screening perspective, also do background checks and everything that's permitted by fair housing, um, so. Are there other questions for the applicant from commissioners at this time? Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the commission for staff? Um, I, I guess I do. Um, you know, I, one of the, 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 I think we've covered most of my concerns, but, um, and, and I'll just be upfront and say, I mean, I, I haven't been concerned as much about the high density. I think that was part, part of the vision. Um, but you know, the way the building is designed is still, it doesn't seem to fit into the vision we had. And I understand the vision is not a specification. So we can't expect that, you know, a developer to necessarily match what we envisioned. Um, but I, I guess a couple of the curious questions here. Um, when, when I asked the question of the developer about other layouts, um, it, 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 um, the impression I got was that there really wasn't anything else we could do here, like having two buildings like we have in the vision, or are there other opportunities to, to break this up a little bit and make it fit better in, as a transition, kind of what that vision met, and kind of being a more welcoming kind of uh, a layout. Um, you have any uh, thoughts on that, Anthony? Um, you know, I can't really speak to like the decision-making process on what's, um, what makes a feasible project and if they could have had two buildings versus one. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, conventional wisdom is that one building is a little bit more efficient from an energy standpoint and mm -hmm. construction standpoint. Um, you know, the applicant is meeting all the requirements of the city code, um, which as you can see on the site plan requires a lot of parking, uh, but we did hear uh, the planning commission does did receive a bunch of uh, mm -hmm. a lot of comments that um, the neighborhood would really prefer a two stall per unit parking um, provision. So, you know, I think there's a lot of city code issues, and certainly when the visioning exercise went through, they weren't doing it from a let's review the city code and see what would work here in the way a, a, a true developer would do. Um, so I, I can't really speak to their decision-making process, but I do know that um, the first, some of the initial conversations were to provide that stepped-down side so it is a little lower in height on the side that's closest to the residential area when we initially saw kind of the, the layout uh, being proposed. I, I echo your, your thoughts on the, I liked the design where we had the two buildings, but I think as I look at this, I feel like with the parking, if, if we did two buildings, you know, that in some ways that could push the parking more towards a more visible. I like that the parking is more on the interior, closer to what's gonna be future commercial. And when you're driving down Connemara and you're driving up Abbey Field, that that parking is a little bit more screened. Um, I also feel that that screens some of that parking noise of the shutting of doors. The building gives a little bit of that buffer from that parking lot for the resident. So that kind of played a role when I was looking at, just from a personal perspective of looking at how could we do two buildings and, and still shield shield some of those things. Um, I do echo Commissioner Tiergarden's thoughts on the colors. I think some of the elevations I felt looked really good with architectural elements um, on them, but the one that's got a lot of heavy on the black, I think looks really, makes it look really heavy. And so I, I hear what you're saying there and I almost would encourage maybe, um, you know, should this move forward and proceed I encourage the applicant maybe to look at some of the, it'd be nice to have it, have some cohesive with, with lifetime and both apartment buildings, like I just make it like that we have colors that all look together, like work together. Um, and so maybe there's something that we can do there to bring it all together to look, we can start developing an area that looks like it was all developed together almost. Um, and then maybe we can look to bring these same, the color elements here into the commercial that as Ladar works with future commercial tenants, kind of have similar look and feel as well. So that's kind of my, that was kind of my thoughts on the, I struggled with the multiple building too um, piece of it, but I feel like the jog in it and the setbacks, that do help, it's not just a straight um, building. So I feel like that kind of helps a little bit there, just to share a different perspective. Yep, yeah, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the commission? I have some comments, but no questions. Okay, go ahead. We can start comments. Um, well, first of all, I did venture out, like I said, to the property. My husband and I biked out there. I've drove past it a couple times because I think as a planning commissioner, it's my due diligence to look and see what the residents are coming and talking and taking their time to get educated and, and research, which I'm hearing tonight. So I, be, I believe it's my due diligence to go in and actually check it out physically myself to see what, what you folks are talking about. Um, and I, I just, I kind of stood there and, and I, I can't um, in good faith vision a, a four story apartment building in the middle of, it's all residential and it doesn't flow properly if I was an architect or a planning at, uh, for my career choice, and I'm not. So it, I'm just seeing that, that it just doesn't seem to fit there. It's a beautiful building, by the way. Architect, design, the people that are promoting the building itself, it's beautiful. It just, to me, doesn't fit there. Um, and all of the land that we have here, an opportunity, um, I think one person mentioned it quite nicely is, you know, once we build that, it's gone. And Rosemont, 
I've lived here 13 years. I lived in Egan. I don't expect us to be in Egan, but I have waited, and I know a lot of people in this community have waited for a lot more chance to have economic development and commercial and opportunity and shopping and things to do and whatever they want to do, gathering spaces. And I, I just feel that if we give this up to another apartment building, which we have approved two very large ones tonight, and also, you know, there's housing across the street that's high density that's going to go in as well. Um, I just think that we're going to miss an opportunity here. So I, uh, I, I will not be voting for it to be zoned from C4 to R4 tonight. Are there other comments? Yeah, Mr. Paul. Madam Chair, I think the, the input we've received from staff tonight has really highlighted the need for the additional residential given the constraints, Flint Hills resources, DCTC, contamination, Dakota aggregate being mined till what, 2040, uh, on the need for additional residential in order to support that commercial that we want so badly to come to this area. And that together with the fact that it's been reguided uh, for high density and that they're meeting the city's zoning requirements and you know leads me to vote in favor of rezoning thank you any other comments yes I um, my comment is that growth is rarely linear it's never a straight path and you know in understanding and listening to what Nick had to say and what uh, Logan had to say about how we manage growth as a city, it gives me confidence that as we continue to grow, as we continue to get more dense, there are ways in which as issues come up that we have um, the capability to resolve it, to address it for the residents, to make it a better place. So with that said, um, I understand that this um, the building is, um, long and linear because it's a factor of where the easement is and the shape of that property um, that's being developed. So it's a little bit of both and also trying to make sense of the economics of the development. So uh, I understand that with that in mind, um, the applicant has also um, reduced the height of the building, um, stepped it down in the ends. Um, so they've tried to work with us and they're also um, looking for ways to change some of the elements, architectural elements, to have it blend uh, better with the surroundings. Um, so with that said, I'm in favor of this element. Thank you, Commissioner Tregarjan. Uh, just say that I appreciate the, the work of the developer to take in the, the input from the last meeting to make changes uh, and appreciate uh, all the context that's provided by staff tonight and the information that's been shared. Um, I, I feel like there's a, there's a lot of development, residential development happening around this property with the, the Schaefer Richardson development that we approved tonight um, and the uh, Amber Fields development that's going in across, um, south of 42. Uh, I feel like that is a, a lot of residents that are moving into that area um, with no commercial at all um, <coughs> land other than the lifetime fitness. Uh, so for that reason, I'm not in favor of uh, changing the zoning tonight. Thank you, Commissioner Fair. I, I will um, echo some of the comments that have been made. Um, I do appreciate the developers' updates that they went back and updated the plan um, and, and adding a pickleball court for the residents that live there, making updates to the landscaping and the adjustments on the height, um, also their willingness to look at the architectural elements um, here. I, I do feel um, similar to Commissioner Chair Gargen that that growth is not linear. Um, I think you said it very well, very eloquently. Growth is not linear. Um, I believe that the city is is poised to support the residents as we grow um, and work with, with the county and the school district and such in doing that. Um, I do feel that that this is, is close to what we visioned. While it's not multiple buildings like we had visioned for this, the northern part of this commercial parcel, we did when we did our visioning exercise we, we had lengthy conversations about how we needed to continue to grow um, the, the residential areas 
in order to support the com bringing the commercial to this area. And there is still, I feel, a lot of commercial, even with this parcel as residential, which is, for the most part, it's a little bit larger than what we envisioned, but we did envision putting residential up in this northern section of this parcel. Um, I feel like we still do have a lot of commercial just south of the parcel. We've got some commercial south of 42. We have commercial east of here, um, east of Akron with the lifetime area. And then we also have commercial just a little bit further west at 145th and 42. Um, and then there's, um, there's some commercial still um, a little bit further west at um, 3 and 42. So I feel like in this strip and zone, we still do have a lot of commercial to provide the residents um, with commercial amenities on the other side of Highway 3. And I feel like continuing as we continue to add um, some of the residential multifamily housing, it's going to help further spur that development. So um, I do feel that this, this plan is aligned with, for the most part, with our vision. And um, the zoning request does align with our comp plan, which has been approved um, to have this zoned as re multifamily residential. So with that, I will be voting in favor of this this evening. Yeah, I think I already, I, I already said I, I'm in favor of the high density, but just to kind of close out and add, um, and echoing the comments we've heard here, I mean, I, I live just a little bit further west on Connemara, closer to Meadows Park, and so I share some, some of the same concerns about uh, some of the traffic in Connemara and so on, but, but I, th I think I feel comfortable with the way uh, the city has done their analysis, uh, answering questions about the infrastructure, and, and Logan, I appreciate, it. I think, the perspective on, you know, from the Port Authority and some of the growth that really does seem to have a lot of logic behind it and why we're doing this. So I, I am in favor as well. Thank you. Um, so this evening, we do have a couple motions before us. Um, Madam Chair? Yes. I'd like to make the first motion to recommend <laughs> the City Council approve a zoning map amendment to rezone the site from C4 PUD. Community Commercial Plan Unit Development to R4, High Density Residential subject to the Metropolitan Council approval of the Comprehensive Land Use Plan change of the site from Community Commercial to High Density Residential. Second. It has been moved by Commissioner Powell and seconded by Commissioner Reed. Jesse, I'm going to ask you to take roll. Yep. Powell Move by roll. Powell. Aye. Rivera. Nay. Kenninger. Aye. Reed. Aye. Hebert? Nay. Tigger te er, Grajan? Aye. <laughs> Motion carries 4-2. All right. Counting lesson for me. <laughs> I'll make a motion to recommend City Council approve the preliminary and final plats for the Rowers apartment project subject to conditions A through G. Second. And uh, before we move forward with that one, I just want to ask Anthony, um, both Commissioner Tiergarden and I echoed some some interest in having them look at the colors do, and the the architectural elements. Um, do we need to add that as a condition? So um, those sorts of things aren't required by the code, and so yeah. it's um, not recommended to add conditions that go above and beyond the code. But certainly, um, those recommendations will be brought forward to the City Council. Um, the City Council members do watch all of the meetings, the planning commission meetings, and uh, get a copy of the minutes and a summary. Okay, and it's something that you um, can pass on to Julie and maybe work with the applicant yep. on Absolutely. for city council meeting. Oh, thank you, I apologize, I just wanted to Sorry. confirm that before we move forward. Pr procedural question, if we yes. voted nay to the first motion, do we, can, do we vote for motions two and three? You will need to vote um, yes, e yes you, Yes, you you should vote. Um, I don't know. I would lend to our attorney if they voted no on the first one. They voting yes on the second one kind of seems contradictory. Actually, I would I would say the reverse. Now that the motion has passed, you should vote with that in mind. Thank would you. you approve the um, plat in light of the fact that the the consider it to have been done? It's now been rezoned. What do you think of the plat? Thank you. With that, we have a motion in front of us that I believe was made by Commissioner Reed and seconded by Commissioner Powell. Mm -hmm. Do I have that right? Yes. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. um, Jesse, will you take roll again? Yes, Rivera. Nay. 
Kenninger? Aye. Reed? Aye. Hebert? Aye. Tigger Garden? Aye. Uh, Powell? Aye. Rivera? Oh, I'm sorry, I already said Rivera. I was going to vote twice. You got two. to vote twice. Um, motion passes 5 1. <laughs> And then our last one this evening, I will make a motion to recommend City Council approve the site plan review for the proposed multifamily community subject con to conditions A through D as outlined in the staff report. Second. It has been moved by Commissioner Henniger and seconded by Commissioner Reed. Jesse, please take roll. Kenninger? Aye. Reed? Aye. Eber? Aye. Tigger Garden? Aye. Powell? Aye. Rivera? Nay. Motion passes 5-1. This item will proceed forward to the city council meeting on November 15th. Um, as, as the applicant exits the room, thank you for your work on this. Thank you for the updates to the plan. Um, and we appreciate you taking a look at the architectural elements and colors. Thank you. Thank you. We'll give just a minute uh, before we proceed with the next item on our agenda this evening for those that are clearing out to do so. Madam Chair, what is the next item? The next, <laughs> <laughs> the next item is Hawkins. Okay. It's as if you have a lot going on, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> the next item on our public hearing agenda this evening is a request by Hawkins, Inc. for approval of a site plan review related to the construction of two additions onto the existing manufacturing and warehouse building on site. And Anthony, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is a request for a site plan review due to the fact that the two additions uh, total 47,000 square feet which is above the threshold of 50% of the building area that would trigger the site plan review uh, process. A PUD was approved in 2011 uh, for the construction of the existing building. At that time, the two proposed additions were planned as future additions and shown on the site plans, although um, a condition of approval at the time was that uh, those additions would be required to go through uh, the site plan review process <laughs> uh, for the reasons I just highlighted. Uh, the Hawkins facility is located in the eastern portion of the city, uh, just south of Courthouse Boulevard and east of Highway 52, uh, out near the Flint Hills Refinery. Uh, to the south is the Flint Hills ATS terminal, and then some additional uh, uh, industrial uses uh, in the surrounding parcels. The site area is 27.86 acres in size. Uh, it's zoned high in, uh, heavy industrial and the existing building is uh, just over 63,000 square feet. Uh, it contains a mixture of manufacturing space and warehousing. Uh, and then additionally, the center of the property does contain a small tank farm. Uh, the proposed additions would be on the, I guess, northwest side of the building and the northeast side of the building. Uh, just to go through some of the parking requirements, there is a shortage of two stalls due to the size of the area. Staff is recommending approval with the condition that the applicant uh, identify an area for two stalls to be shown as a proof of parking. Uh, the mix of uses does allow for a different calculation for the uh, required parking. When the uh, original approval went through, there was an excess of 22 stalls uh, required. Uh, with the addition, a total of 24 more stalls are required based on the size of the building and the uses within, uh, 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 resulting in that two parking stall uh, increase required. Uh, staff is recommending that as a proof of parking uh, due to the fact that the applicant uh, does not necessarily anticipate uh, uh, an increase in need of their existing parking. Uh, the utilities into the site are shown on the utility plan. Um, there isn't a whole lot to say as the site is already developed. You can see that there's uh, some uh, uh, um, pipes coming in from the north as well as storm water uh, in the southern portion of the site. Uh, here's a floor plan of the existing uh, building, these two additions, uh, these two warehouse additions in the north and west uh, sides here. On the south, these kind of um, Angled areas are for truck loading zones. So this is just a close in on the northern addition, um, just a, a open warehouse space, as well as the western addition. Here are some elevations showing the, the proposed additions. This north addition does include some aggregate concrete uh, vertical um, treatments to break up that wall. That was a condition of the original approval and is being carried through uh, on this addition along that same elevation. 
Otherwise, it's uh, t concrete tip-up tip panels that uh, are consistent with the building as it currently exists on the site. So um, staff is making a recommendation uh, <coughs> to approve the site plan and building design review uh, to allow the construction of the two additions um, subject to the conditions, one of which being the applicant work with uh, staff to um, identify a spot for two additional stalls as a proof of parking. Thank you, Anthony. Are there any comments or questions from the commission? Okay. This item is a public hearing item this evening, so at this time we'll open up the public hearing. Anyone in the audience that would like to come forward and speak on this item may do so at this time, stating your name and address for the record. Seeing none, I will make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner Kenniger, seconded by Commissioner Reed to close the public hearing. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Public hearing is now closed. Any further comments or questions from the commission on this item? Madam Chair, I'll make a motion to approve the site plan and building design review for Hawkins Inc. to allow the construction of two additions totaling 47,000 square feet onto the existing manufacturing and warehouse building on site, subject to the three conditions identified in the staff report. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner Powell and seconded by Commissioner Rivera. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. This item will move forward to City Council on November 15th. And I think I said that with the last item as well, but that item also is moving forward tentatively to City Council on November 15th. And the last item on our public hearing agenda this evening is a request by McGow Development for preliminary and final plat approval related to a future development at South Robert Trail and 160th. Anthony. It's yours again. Shocker, huh? <laughs> um, okay, so this is a request by a developer uh, of the site that's north and east of the intersection of Highway 3 and County Road 46 for preliminary and final plats uh, to create a parcel uh, that would be used in uh, anticipation of future development on the site. Uh, the applicant does plan to construct an office warehouse building, uh, um, either multi-tenant or single-tenant, uh, the proposed plat does meet the dimensional standards for parcels in the business park zoning district. Um, this is located, as I said, north and east of 160th and uh, South Robert Trail. As the commission may recall, uh, following a small area study, this area was reguided and rezoned to business park development. Subsequently, the parcel on the west side of South Robert Trail uh, was platted and received approval to construct uh, 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 manufacturing facility with some outdoor storage on there. Uh, that approval included a, a rezone to light industrial to accommodate that outdoor storage. The applicant is uh, again uh, proposing to plat the site in anticipation of future development. Uh, just a reminder as uh, I just spoke, the zoning of the site is business park and then the land use is uh, uh, business park as well. The proposed plat uh, is shown here on the right is uh, Highway or County Road 46, uh, and then South Robert Trail is on the west of the site and the on the uh, bottom of the screen. On the north, uh, you can see the ghost of the platted extension of Boulder uh, Trail that will be connecting with Highway 3. Access onto the site when it develops will be across an outlot uh, that was reserved from that development of the Home Depot site uh, and will be ultimately um, allowed for uh, a private driveways. So the recommendation is simply to recommend the City Council approve the preliminary and final uh, plats of the Rosemount Industrial Edition subject to conditions one in five in the staff report. Um, I can take any questions the commission may have at this time. Are there any questions from commission? Anthony, yeah, you say access would be off of? Uh, the extension of Boulder, correct. Uh, there will be one additional access in the southeast corner due to the fact that there is an existing access uh, down there, but primarily the access will be from the north. Any other questions or comments from the commission? This item is a public hearing item this evening, so at this time we will open up the public hearing. Anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this item may do so at this time, coming to the podium, stating your name and address for the record. Seeing none, I will make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. It has been moved by Commissioner Kenniger and seconded by Commissioner Abair. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? 
Motion carries. The public hearing is now closed. Any, well, I have just one comment. I'm kind of excited that we're seeing this area start to develop and, and get some planning going and getting some movement with, um, we have the Home Depot warehouse building and some other activity out there, so it's exciting. So thank you to those that are bringing these projects forward for that area. Any other comments or questions? I'll make a motion to recommend the City Council approve the preliminary and final Rosemount Industrial Edition plats subject to the five conditions identified in the staff memo. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner Powell and seconded by Commissioner Abair. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. This item passes and we'll move forward to the City Council meeting with our recommendation for the November 15th meeting tentatively. Anything always subject to change. That concludes our public hearing section this evening. Is there any new business this evening? No new, no new business, Madam Chair, other than just a, a couple of comments from staff when you're ready. Okay, go ahead. Um, just, uh, again, thank you to the Planning Commission. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of detail, a lot of very intense information in front of you this evening. And I know, um, Madam Chair, you addressed it just in your comment now, but to certainly highlight the two large industrial and manufacturing expansions happening as a part of this agenda. Um, I was at an event with the mayor this morning and he made sure to highlight that along with many others that are occurring across the community. These are projects that bring both jobs, tax base, as well as other benefits to the community. Kind of gets buried on the agenda tonight, but these are very big projects, significant projects we should certainly be proud of to see come forward. Thank you. Um, I will just take this moment also to um, thank the city staff that was here tonight. Um, if you can also pass along our thanks to um, the representative from Dakota County that came, um, Dan from Park and Rec who was here as well, um, and also our city attorney. Um, we thank you for, for being here this evening and for addressing public concerns and the questions that we had from the last meeting. So thank you for all the time and work that went into that and um, also from the planning perspective, Adam, Anthony, and pass it on to Julie as well. Thank you for your time with those items um, that we continued from the last meeting and I know that um, was a lot of work to pull it all together. We appreciate the additional detail and information. Um, I will also just do a reminder, we, our next meeting is November 22nd. Um, falls in line with the fourth Tuesday and the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Um, the December meeting, just a reminder, that is December 19th. It is not a normal um, Tuesday meeting due to the holidays. And then I believe our first January meeting will be January 23rd, um, which would follow our normal fourth Tuesday schedule. And um, Adam, can we, maybe we can work on a calendar for the next November meeting to yep, so then have we that can, on the agenda? Yep, so that gets on everybody's schedule. So it would be January 24th would be the fourth Tuesday oh. of January in 2023. I don't want to think too far ahead yet, but um, no, we'll certainly be able to provide a calendar at your uh, next meeting about what. Thank you. You said December 19th. December 19th, I have that right, right? Uh, I, I believe so from our previous discussion. I don't have that in front of me. That's the, that's the date I gave last month, so um, I, I'm pretty sure because it's a Monday. Yep, so it would be the December 19th. Um, and, and we'll certainly send out that information to the planning commissioners based on the previous um, scheduling decisions. Yes, and thank you for catching my incorrect 2024, 2023 date. Let's not move a whole year ahead too fast. Okay, with that, I will adjourn the public or the planning commission meeting for this evening. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.